said Anderson. She's quite upset. She likes Lacey. But you knew that, didn't you? She told us the two of you have met her, that Lacey visited you at your house. I'm extremely fond of Constable Flint. I would not dream of harming her. I haven't harmed any of the young women who have been in my clinic. Possibly, possibly not, said Dana. But what you need to be worrying about is how long it's going to take before we decide one way or the other. What do you mean? Where is my sister now? You think the worst that can happen is losing your license and your reputation, Dana pressed on. Ultimately, you may be right, but your assistant has identified two of our victims. We've got more than enough to charge you with murder. And unless we find Lacey and the other two missing women in the next few hours, that's exactly what we're going to do. You're an immigrant with a habit of travelling abroad. No magistrate will give you bail. You'll be stuck in a British prison for the next six months while we get ready for a trial. She waited, giving Christakos a chance to take in what she was telling him, and then went in for the kill. What will she do, do you think, without you to keep her in check? What will she do tonight if she has any of these young women? What will she do to Lacey? Chapter 88 Pari As soon as Pari's feet became free, she scrambled to the edge of the skip. The rubbish was several feet deep, and once she started moving, she began to sink into it. But she made it over the side and dropped to the floor of the barge. And now she had to drink or she would die for sure. If necessary, she'd lean over the side and lap up the Thames. She spotted an upturned plastic tub with perhaps an inch of water in the bottom. She lifted it, tasted it, and poured the rest down her throat. Better. Her thirst assuaged, Pari glanced to the north bank. She couldn't swim, had never learned to swim. There might be something on this barge that could help her float, but the water was moving so fast. She stood upright, or as upright as she could manage on the constantly shifting underlay of rubbish, and looked around. Maybe there'd be a boat that could help her. Help! she yelled. And then, as though her longing had had the power to conjure up rescue from the ether, she heard the gentle hum of a small outboard engine. Help! she yelled again, into the void that was the Black River. For the love of God, be quiet, replied a voice in her own language. Chapter 89. Lacey. The water had reached Lacey's waist. She couldn't stand upright. The rope around her neck was too short. She tried everything she could think of, and there was no way she could get her face higher than the waterline on the bricks opposite. She had less than an hour. Once already, it could have been minutes or seconds ago, she couldn't be sure. She'd lost it completely. She'd screamed until her throat felt as though it were bleeding, but the only answer she'd received had been the gentle lapping of the returning waves. And now panic was building again. Her chest was growing tighter. She couldn't think, couldn't plan, couldn't be calm. All she could do was scream. Except that wasn't her voice. That sound, winding its way through the darkness, wasn't even a scream, more like a moan, or an echo of a moan. Hello? Is someone there? For a moment, only the sonorous mumblings of the water answered her. Then, Lacey? Nadia? Hope surged through Lacey's body. She wasn't alone. Nadia, I'm over here. Where are you? Lacey, I can't move. Nadia sounded ill, exhausted. Hope died. Lacey, they've tied me up. The water. Come and get me, please. Where are you? Lacey was spinning in the water, the rope cutting like a blade into her neck, trying to locate the source of Nadia's voice and knowing she was planting cruel and hopeless ideas of rescue in the other woman's head. Sounds of hands slapping hard against water. Then Nadia cried out again, reverting to her own language in her terror. She wasn't anywhere close. Lacey took hold of the rope again and pulled hard. It held as firm as ever. Nadia was screaming now, and that was the sound of someone choking. Wherever Nadia was, she'd been tied up closer to the sewer floor than Lacey, and the water had reached her already. The screaming and the struggles and the choking went on. Lacey closed her eyes tight 
and would have given anything to close her ears too, so that she wouldn't be able to listen to the sound of another woman drowning. After a few more seconds, she realized she didn't need to. The sound of her own sobbing was masking just about everything else. It takes a long time, she learned, for a strong young woman to drown. Chapter 90 Pari Pari stared out across the water. The voice had come from the direction of the furthest bank. Who's there? she called. Who is it? The sound came hissing back towards her, soft and urgent, sibilant. Shh! Pari rubbed her eyes. Something was making its way towards her. A small craft, without lights. As it grew closer, Pari could see the pale, carved wood of the hull, and then the driver, an old woman, wearing a black hood and cloak, and with only her large, pale face visible. She was struggling with the current. It was almost taking her past, sweeping her away downstream. But she managed to toss the rope, and Pari caught it. The woman stared up at her. You need to get in, she said, in Pashto. Quick, there isn't much time. Who are you? Pari was suddenly reluctant to leave the relative security of the barge and climb down into that frail-looking boat. Are you taking me back there? I'm taking you somewhere safe, where no one can hurt you again, but you have to hurry. Are you the one who sings to us? Pari was trying to match the voice she was listening to with the one she remembered coming from below her window. The one who helps us get away? Aye, aye, the old woman pointed upstream. Will you look? They're coming. Don't you understand? They'll throw you in. Me too, if they catch me. Pari followed the woman's stare. Sure enough, there was a pinprick of light on the water, heading towards them. Who is it? she asked. If you're not coming, I'm going without you. I daren't let them catch me. It was the woman's terror that convinced her, and the light was getting bigger, heading directly towards them. Pari swung both legs over the rail and lowered herself into the boat. At a nod from the old lady, she loosened the rope and pushed hard against the barge. The distance between the boat and the pontoon grew quickly, and Pari realized the old lady was steering them out to the middle of the channel. Where are we going? she demanded. Get to the bank. The woman was looking upstream. We can't. That's the way they're coming. She was right. The oncoming boat was close to the north bank. They had no choice but to cross the river. Pari turned round, trying to judge how far it was. The tide's taking us, her companion said. Can you row? Pari had no idea, but the lights from the approaching boat were getting bigger. She picked up the oars and pulled as hard as she could. Ignoring the pain in her head, she did it again and again. She kept pulling. The old lady clung to the tiller, as though sheer force of will could make the engine work harder. But as they moved closer to the centre of the river, Pari wasn't sure how much more she had to give. Each stroke was getting harder, but every time she looked up, the lights on the pursuing boat were closer to the rubbish barge, closer to discovering she'd gone. The waves were bouncing over the side of the boat, soaking them both, and too much water was gathering in the bottom, but every stroke took them closer to the opposite bank. Pari carried on rowing, her eyes fixed firmly on the planking of the boat, dreading to see the lights of the pursuing boat almost on top of them. The current's easing off now, said the old lady at last. You can probably stop rowing. Pari looked up and round. They were drawing close to the bank. She pulled the oars out of the water and tried to get her breath. Are you all right? said the old lady. I'm Thessa, by the way. You must be Pari. I've seen your name in the books. Pari managed to nod. With a stab of alarm, she saw the pursuing boat at the pontoon. It was big, with lots of lights. It wasn't a boat that seemed to be aiming for stealth, and there seemed to be another drawing up behind. She watched people climb out and start making their way around the skips, looking for her. As the engine slowed and the face of her driver screwed up in concentration, Pari spun round on her seat. A black gap in the river wall had appeared before them. The river water was pouring into it. We can't go in there. It takes us to a ladder. Tessa swung the boat wide and aimed it directly at the outlet. You can climb out. 
oblivious to Pari's whimpered protests, the boat traveled in beneath the arched roof of the sewer, and the night became even darker. Pari blinked furiously. A few yards of brickwork on either side was all she could see. Your night vision will kick in properly soon, said Thessa. Close your eyes for a second or two. Pari closed her eyes for a second. She didn't make it to two. It's hard to keep your eyes closed when someone very close is screaming. Chapter 91 Lacey and Dana The rats had been growing in number. As the water had risen, creeping up the sides of the tunnel, so the eyes had appeared all around Lacey. Eyes that jumped, darted, stabbed at her in the darkness. She was on her feet, the water at chest height, struggling to keep her balance, the wound around her neck raw from her attempts to pull free. She had another twenty minutes, she reckoned, before the water covered her completely. The rats knew it too. They knew their time was running out. They'd gathered on the ledge, just above her head, nostrils twitching, tails flying, ears twisting to every new sound, scrambling over each other in a never-ending quest to be close to her, a writhing mass of plump bodies and thick tails. The eyes were the worst, though, eyes that never seemed to leave hers. One of them sprang, its needle-like claws stabbing her face before it clambered into her hair, more of them coming at her. Screaming, thrashing, she dropped into the water to get them off. Water in her throat, her head banging against the wall, bites in her scalp, her hair being pulled. She couldn't breathe. Something was striking at her head. Someone yelling, threatening. Not her voice. Lacey struggled to her feet and spat out water. She shook her head like a terrier with a rat in its mouth, but no small, cruel creatures clung to her. A short, thin girl with long black hair was standing in the bow of a boat, slamming an oar down hard against the ledge, the wall, even occasionally Lacey's head, and yelling in a language Lacey didn't understand. She would have been a terrifying sight, except the rats had gone. She'd scared away the rats. She says she hates rats, said a voice behind her. It was always her job at home, to scare the rats from out of the backyard. This is Pari, by the way. I'm helping her escape. As though exhausted by the effort, Pari collapsed into the bow of the boat, Thessa's boat. Thessa herself was at the stern, a black cloak drawn around her head and shoulders. She looked at Lacey in astonishment. My darling girl, she said, what on earth are you doing here? Dana sat opposite Christakos and uttered the formalities that would continue the interview. She was conscious of Mark standing immediately behind her, his hands gripping the back of her chair. She should tell him to sit down, if she fancied wasting her breath. There was no sign of Pari on the river, she told Christakos. Our officers have just got back. Christakos's skin had turned several shades paler in the few hours he'd been in custody. She has to be there. We've used it before when we've had to hide girls for a short time. They're perfectly safe. He sounded as though he were trying to convince himself. Did you look properly? I searched every inch of that bloody barge myself, said Mark, before Dana could open her mouth. I found parcel tape in one of the skips that could have been used as a restraint. Other than that, nothing. Christakos dropped his head into his hands. Who is it, said Dana? Who has taken her? He seemed to shrink in front of her eyes. My sister, he said. My sister got to her first. Chapter 92 Lacey and Dana Thessa was giving the two women in her charge medical attention. She had insisted on doing so, in spite of the surroundings. She'd given them both fresh water and wrapped a scarf around Lacey's neck wound. She was helping Pari to escape, she explained. They had to go further into the sewer to find a ladder that would take them safely to the street. She and Pari had been on their way when they'd heard Lacey screaming. According to Thessa, who was well and truly in charge at the moment, there wasn't room for three of them in the boat, so Lacey would have to swim holding on to the side, and to do that she'd need to be feeling a whole lot fitter than she was. Thessa had produced a flask of something that tasted a little like brandy, only thicker and sweeter, 
and made them both drink some of it. Lacey drank and tried to get her head back together again. The water and the brandy helped. She wasn't going to drown, not just yet. Her head hurt, and her throat felt as though it had been ripped open, but she was going to be okay. The rats had gone. The water was rising, but they were safely out of it. She crouched on the ledge, the other two still in Thessa's pretty, silly boat. A boat that somehow seemed to cast a pale, silvery light around itself. Or maybe that was just the light from the strange, old-fashioned lantern that Thessa had switched on. The boat rocked, and Lacey's eyes went to the young woman in the bow. Since her very vocal attack on the rats, Pari hadn't spoken. She was curled up on the narrow seat and looked as if she was in pain, as well as exhausted. In the dim light, Lacey took a proper look at her. Young, slim, long dark hair, pale eyes. Lacey gave one more look around to make sure there were no rats. Then, Thessa, she said, was Pari in that building on East Street? What happens in there? We need to go. Thessa was reaching for the mooring line, untying it. The water will get too high soon to take the boat any further. Lacey, can you get back into the water, do you think? You said you were helping her escape. How did you know she needed to? She sings to us, interrupted Pari. She sings songs from home so that we know we can trust her, and then she helps us get out. I've seen her. Someone else had talked about a woman singing. Nadia. Good God, how could she have forgotten Nadia? Lacey, are you okay? Look at me. Focus. Lacey forced herself to look Thessa in the eyes. Nadia was dead. She'd heard her drown. First the cries of terror, then the screaming, the choking, and finally the silence. Lacey! She couldn't help Nadia. It might not even be possible to retrieve her body until the tide went out again. In the meantime, Thessa was right. The water was getting very high. What's happening to these women? she asked. Suddenly, Thessa looked terribly tired. Tired and sad. Lacey, I don't know. All Alex will tell me is that the girls are trying to escape from a terrible life. He helps them. Alex? This was about Alex. I hear them crying as I go past in my boat. I hear how sad they are, how frightened. I hear them in pain, like this little one here. She turned and smiled at Pari. Some of them aren't just in pain, said Lacey. Some of them are dying. Thessa nodded. A big fat tear wobbled at the corner of her eye and began to roll down her cheek. Thessa, who's doing it? And finally... Thessa's face collapsed into grief. My brother, I'm so sorry, Lacey, but Alex is killing them. It was about a year ago when the first woman vanished from the clinic, said Christakos, as Anderson pulled out onto Lewisham High Street and stepped hard on the accelerator. As they picked up speed, he switched on the blue light. Dana was in the passenger seat. In the back, Mark was cuffed to Christakos. Minutes earlier, they discovered that Christakos' sister was no longer at her house in Deptford. Upon hearing the news, Christakos had been able to think of only one place she might be. They were heading for the river. She owned an old Victorian pumping station, he had explained, which she'd tried to keep secret from him. Whilst impossible for her to access from land, he believed she might be able to use her boat to navigate the sewer system. Jamila Kaka was her name. Christakos went on. We were baffled. We said goodnight to her, locked the door on her room, as is customary, and then the next morning she just wasn't in it. There was no trace of her at all. The bars on the window made climbing out impossible. Her room was still locked. It was like... magic. Dana twisted round in the seat. Did you report her disappearance? Christakos might have taken a blow, but he wasn't all out of arrogance. Of course I didn't, Detective Inspector. Let's not waste time with point scoring. My first thought was that it was someone on the staff, but they denied any knowledge, and it seemed unlikely somehow. They'd been with me for many years. We put it down to carelessness. Someone had accidentally left keys around. Jamila had taken advantage and left. I don't know whether you will believe this or not, 
but I hoped that she was all right. Anderson overtook a stationary car, putting them directly in line with an oncoming bus. But that wasn't the end of it. Mark wasn't wearing his seatbelt. Neither was Christakos. None of them were. Had she been reckless, agreeing to this high-speed dash to an abandoned building on the riverbank? Sadly, it was just the beginning. Christakos was speaking directly to Mark now. Not long afterwards, another woman vanished in exactly the same manner, even though we'd changed the locks. I couldn't put it down to carelessness a second time. Someone had let her out. All the staff pleaded ignorance. I could hardly threaten them with the authorities. Besides, something told me they were telling the truth. I know my sister very well. Traffic, for the most part, was letting them through. They were in Deptford already, not far from the river. Excuse me pointing out the obvious, said Mark, but from what I understand, your sister is in a wheelchair. How does she manage to make her way around that three-story house, helping young women escape and smuggling them safely away? You'd be surprised by what Thessa can achieve. Christakos looked oddly proud. She never let her disability stand in her way. She was always the strong one. I realized she'd been accessing confidential documents on the computer. I've never managed to devise a password that she hasn't guessed. But she left a trail, of course. I could see that documents had been accessed when I'd been out of the office. Only she could have done that. And she started going out in that boat of hers at all hours. She smuggles keys to them somehow, and then takes them away by water. Did you challenge her? Christakos shook his head. She wasn't comfortable with the clinic, I knew that. If it made her happy to help one or two women leave sooner than they might otherwise have done, I was willing to live with that. I wasn't sure how much longer I was going to keep going anyway. You were willing to let her take these women and drown them? Christakos twisted round to face Mark directly. I had no idea they were coming to harm. It was only just over a week ago, when you found Anya in the Thames, that I realised what was happening. You realised she wasn't helping them escape at all, said Dana gently. Christakos shook his head. No, she was killing them. Chapter 93. Lacey and Dana. Alex is in custody. Thessa steered the boat through the channel of the sewer. She and Pari were still on board. Lacey was clinging to the stern. They couldn't risk the engine, with Lacey being so close to the propeller, so Thessa and Pari were using the oars as paddles. Lacey was pushing against the wall to keep them moving, hating every moment of being in the water. He was arrested this morning, Thessa went on. The staff of the clinic are all at Lewisham Police Station too, but there are other men involved the ones who bring the girls here in the first place. He'll have given them instructions to go back for Pari once it was dark. Alex doesn't know I own the pumping station, but they could easily decide to look in the sewer. They were back at the fork in the tunnel, but other than a faint gleam in the darkness, Lacey could see nothing of the opening onto the Thames. Thessa turned the boat to follow the right-hand fork. Not much further, on the right-hand side. Nearly there, girls. Lacey looked up at her. In the darkness of the tunnel, Thessa's eyes looked huge. How long have you known? About Alex? Thessa didn't break the slow, steady rhythm of paddling. I've known about the clinic for a long time. I wasn't comfortable, but I've always trusted Alex. He was always the strong one. You didn't say anything to him. Thessa seemed not to have heard, was telling the story in her own way. I started singing to them as I went past in the evenings. I thought it would help to hear a song from home, so I sang something I remember my mother singing to Alex and me when we were tiny. And then, one night, one of the women called out to me, begging me to help her escape. I ignored her, just went motoring past, but all night I couldn't get it out of my head. I kept thinking, I could, I could help her escape. I could easily find keys attach them to a ball of cork so they wouldn't sink, and throw them into an open window. After that, it was easy. They'd creep down the stairs, let themselves out at the back, get into my boat, and I'd bring them here. I gave them money and the details of some people I know who helped them get settled. Four nights ago, Pari had twisted round to face the others. I heard you singing, 
and I saw you throw keys. I saw someone leave. Thessa frowned and put her head to one side. No, dear, she said, after a second. I think you're getting mixed up. How many did you help get away, said Lacey, as Pari began counting on her fingers. Thessa's arms seemed frozen in the act of paddling. The question brought Thessa's attention back. She started paddling again. Only four. I'd have done more, but I could only leave the house when I knew Alex was out and not at the clinic. He doesn't leave me alone very much. Pari gave a little shrug and picked up her own paddle. Lacey paused a moment before asking the difficult question. Why are some of them dying? Thessa shook her head. I don't know. I didn't know they were until a couple of weeks ago, when I found Anya. Who's Anya? The body you found in the river, dear, when you were out swimming a week last Thursday. I found her in South Dock Marina just days earlier. She'd broken loose of her weights somehow. I don't understand, said Pari. Which of you found Anya? Thessa did, said Lacey, and then she left her somewhere she knew I'd find her. What about the woman on my boat? Were you responsible for her, too? I'm sorry about that, dear. It must have been a dreadful shock. But you weren't getting the message. I thought the crabs might do it, or the boats, that you'd make the connection with the marina. But I guess I was hoping for too much. How much further? Pari was looking ahead again. I can't see any ladder. I have good eyes. I can't see anything. Pari had good eyes. Four nights ago, she'd seen Thessa rescuing one of the other women from the building on East Street. Two nights ago, someone, whom Lacey now knew to be Thessa, had strung the body of a freshly drowned young woman up on Lacey's boat. But Thessa had denied rescuing the woman. No, dear, I think you're getting mixed up. Suddenly, Lacey was very conscious of being within striking reach of Thessa's paddle. I couldn't let it carry on, dear, Thessa was saying. Not when I knew the girls were being harmed. But it was beyond me, I'm afraid, to call the police about my own brother. I thought, if the bodies were found, if he knew the police were investigating, he might stop. Why pick me? I'd seen you swimming, and in your canoe, and on your big, fast police boat. I knew you were the one. So it had been Thessa, in her little boat, who'd been visiting Lacey's yacht at night. Thessa, who'd left hearts and crabs and eventually a corpse. In some ways, it made much more sense if the stalker had been trying to warn Lacey rather than frighten her. Except... But the women are being brought here to die. Nadia told me. She told me they're tied by the neck to mooring rings and left to drown just like I was. How can Alex be killing them if he doesn't know about this place? Nadia? Thessa looked genuinely surprised. Nadia Suffy, she was here with me today. She was at East Street, too. Thessa's big eyes opened even wider in astonishment. Nadia was here. She turned back to look along the long stretch of water. Yes, she brought me. I didn't want to say anything before because I didn't want to frighten you. She was attacked. Someone pulled her out of the boat. I think she's dead. Nadia was attacked today. I'm not sure that's pos- began Thessa. There was a sudden sound which none of them had made. The sound of something falling or slithering into the water. Lacey drew her legs up beneath her, wondering if rats could swim. Thessa had stopped paddling, was sitting bolt upright, her eyes flicking from Lacey to Pari and back again. Put the oar down for a moment, Pari dear, she said. We have to keep going, Lacey countered. Thessa ignored her, her attention still fixed on the noise they'd just heard. In the pale light of the lantern, she seemed to be changing. Her shoulders had drawn back, her head was up, her eyes shining again. She looked taller, younger, stronger. Then, too quick for Lacey to stop her, she reached to one side and caught hold of a mooring ring. In a flash, she'd pushed the boat's rope through it and pulled it tight. They stopped dead. Thessa, said Lacey, as cold realisation sank in. How could Alex have killed Nadia if he's been in custody all day? Fred and his crew were waiting at the jetty. 
the same one from which Dana had climbed aboard the trafficker's boat not twenty-four hours earlier. As they ran down the riverside steps to meet him, Anderson got a call on his radio. He held up a hand, indicating that they should all wait. Pete, Tom and Gail are at the pumping station, he told them, after listening for a few seconds. Uniform are on their way. As far as they can tell, it's empty, but they can't be sure until the door-breaking squad arrive. How far is it? Mark was looking round, back up the concrete steps, at the wide expanse of embankment, the nearby office buildings. About two hundred yards down river. Christakos used the hand that wasn't cuffed to indicate almost due south. The outlet that Thessa must use to access it, about twenty yards upstream. He pointed in the opposite direction. Fred was looking grim. I'm sorry, Dana, he said, before she could open her mouth. There's no way we can get in that tunnel until the tide drops a bit. Four more hours at least. Mark strode right up to his uncle. If they're not in the pumping station, they have to be in the tunnel somewhere. Fred didn't back down. Those tunnels are all but flooded. I've got a boat slap bang by the entrance, and it can stay there till we know more, but there's no way I can risk any of my officers going in. Give me a frigging dinghy, I'll do it. Not happening, my friend. Dana put a hand on Mark's shoulder. Get back in the car, she told him. We'll drive round there. How many women are we talking about, Mr. Christakos? Back in the car, moving too slowly around industrial buildings, Dana had a sense of needing to keep the conversation moving, if only to keep Mark from exploding. How many women did your sister help escape from the clinic? How many more corpses were waiting for them somewhere on the riverbed? Christakos closed his eyes, as though thinking hard. She heard him mutter the name Jamila, then something that sounded like Shireen. Number four was a Yas, number five Umu. Please let that be the last. They'd found five bodies. That was enough. She could see the pumping station, a small, neat, but otherwise unremarkable brick building not far from the river. Christakos had named a sixth, a seventh, more. Good God, there were nine. Four more somewhere, except... Mr. Christakos, the third one you mentioned, who was that again? Christakos opened his eyes. The third was Nadia Safi, he said. A woman of 28, from Kost province, in southeastern Afghanistan. She vanished on the 10th of January this year, not long after she arrived. A spasm of what looked like pain passed across his face. Is she one of the women you found? Is she dead too? Chapter 94 Lacey and Dana You said your brother's been with the police all day, Lacey reminded Thessa. So he couldn't have been here. He couldn't have killed Nadia. He couldn't have left me to drown. She looked round quickly, peering into the darkness, wondering how far away the ladder was and whether anything she'd been told in the last half hour had been true. No, agreed Thessa. He couldn't, could he? How silly of me not to think of that. Pari, can you get out of the boat? Lacey was moving again, making sure she was at least an arm's length from Thessa. Walk along the ledge until you come to the ladder, then climb it. I'll be right behind you. Confused, still frightened, Pari didn't move. She trusted Thessa, not Lacey. It wouldn't be easy to get her out of the boat. My brother is a good man, Lacey. Thessa unfastened her cloak and let it fall from her shoulders. A little misguided, perhaps, but a good man. I'm sorry for what I said about him. She was unbuttoning her blouse. Lacey opened her mouth to ask her what the hell she thought she was doing and realised it was hardly top of the list. Thessa, she said instead. Did you kill them? Thessa was pulling off her blouse, revealing the flat, empty breasts of an old woman and the well-developed musculature of someone who had been swimming for years. Yes. She stretched out her arms, rotating each shoulder like a swimmer before a race. I am entirely responsible for their deaths. How's the water, dear? No, no, not her friend, Thessa. Christ, she couldn't panic. Whatever you have planned, Thessa, I'm stronger than you are. You can't even walk. Through. Thessa's left hand reached to her waist and unfastened her skirt. She unwrapped it letting Lacey see what was beneath. But I can swim. She gave a big, happy smile. 
Lacey said nothing. She couldn't see much. She could see enough. Behind her, she heard Pari mutter something in her own language that sounded as though it might be a prayer. Well? Thessa looked down at her own naked body, then back up at Lacey. Aren't you going to say, what are you? That's what they always say. You're the mermaid. Thessa positively beamed. How sweet of you. I've always loved mermaids. Did you know Alexander the Great's sister was a mermaid called Thessaloniki? That's how I chose my name. My real one is quite different. But you'd know all about that, wouldn't you? Lacey was suddenly conscious of shivering violently. You know nothing about me. You killed all those women. You tried to kill me in the marina. The naked old creature at the stern of the boat smiled even wider. My darling girl, if I'd wanted to kill you, I would have. Trust me. I was simply trying to show you what you and your colleagues were incapable of finding for yourselves. As Lacey tried to process what she was hearing, Thessa sighed. But in the greater scheme of things, you're right. About not really knowing you, I mean. She nodded, then seemed to leap from the seat. A second later, she'd vanished. Pari, get out of the boat now! Holding the bow in place against the wall with one hand, Lacey pulled at the terrified Afghan girl with the other. Come on, we have to find a ladder. As the other girl wobbled and scrambled to get from the small, unsteady boat onto the narrow, wet ledge, Lacey kept her eyes on the water all around them. Thessa was down there, probably very close. She gave one last shove on Pari's backside, kicked the boat away, and prepared to pull herself out of the water, just as something dragged her beneath the surface. The water was dark. She struck the smooth wood of the boat. As she pushed away from it, her shoulders bounced against the rough brickwork of the walls. She used it to navigate, to get herself to the surface, to start breathing again. Pari was inching along the ledge, towards the ladder that would take her to safety, but her terrified eyes were fixed on Lacey. She wasn't moving nearly fast enough. Lacey looked back at the tunnel, nothing to see but the troubled water steadying itself, nothing to hear but dripping from the arched roof and the splash of waves against the walls. Then a crippling weight had attached itself to her legs and was dragging her down again. Lacey went below the surface in an instant. Something was clawing at her, trying to get a tighter grip. She kicked hard and broke free for a second before teeth sank into her thigh. Lacey almost forgot she was submerged in the instinct to howl. She bent herself double and struck hard with her right fist, her strongest hand. She hit hard and felt the grip on her loosening. One more, and she broke the surface again. The ledge was close, anything to be out of the water. She was on the point of reaching the slime-encrusted stone when two strong hands closed around her throat and she was going under for what felt like the last time. This was it. She'd be the next body they found, shrouded in white linen. Or maybe she wouldn't. Maybe she'd lie at the bottom of the river for all time. Thessa seemed to be everywhere, to have grown in size, to have numerous limbs, to be doubly strong. For a second, Lacey even wondered if there were three of them in the water, if Pari had jumped in to help. Yes, definitely three of them. She was being held by more than two hands. Then one pair of hands let go, and the body that they might belong to, almost impossible to tell, had flung itself at the third person. It was one mass of wriggling, kicking, biting limbs. In a last effort to be free, Lacey twisted round like an eel, and she was loose. Feet away, Pari was still crouched against the tunnel wall, her hands clutched to her face in horror. Her clothes were dry. Lacey gave the biggest leap she was capable of. With Pari clutching her shoulders, it was the work of moments to haul herself onto the ledge and stagger to her feet. On impulse, she reached down into the boat and pulled out the nearest oar. A weapon of any kind felt like a good idea right now. Pressed against the slime-damp wall of the tunnel, she tried to get her breath, cough out river water and locate the woman who'd attacked her all at the same time. At her side, Pari was pointing at something. There she was, not three yards away, head rising out of the water, hair spreading out in every direction. 
shoulders that looked impossibly wide and strong. A terrifying creature, teeth bared in a snarl, staring at her with the huge eyes of a madwoman, climbing out of the water, staggering to her feet on the ledge, getting ready to attack again. A woman who, and this was just about impossible to process in the circumstances, was most definitely not Bessa. Nadia Safi was a very troubled young woman, said Christakos, as Anderson drew up on the concrete embankment by the pumping station. Two patrol cars and an unmarked Toyota that Dana recognised as belonging to Misen were already parked next to the building. Dana had altered the seating arrangements in the car, mainly to separate Mark from Christakos. She was now in the back seat, cuffed to their prisoner. She nodded for him to go on. We could see that from the moment she arrived, he said. We put it down to her exceptionally traumatic journey, even by the standards of what our guests usually have to undergo. Are you talking about her arrest? said Anderson, an edge in his voice. I'm talking about the fact that she nearly drowned that night, Christakos countered. Your officers made the people bringing her panic. They tried to flee, their boat overturned. Nadia nearly died. She was still having nightmares about it when she came to us. She didn't die because PC Flint leapt in after her and pulled her to safety, snapped Mark, risking her own life in the process. Was that Lacey? For the time it took to blink, Christakos's face lit up. I had no idea, but back to Nadia. We soon realised it was more than the shock of recent events. This was something that ran very deep. How much do you know about my country, Detective Inspector? Out of the corner of her eye, Dana saw Stenning and Misen get out of their vehicle. Both Anderson and Mark opened their doors. She held up her hand for them to give her a minute. I visited India several times, she said. I have family there, but I've never been to Afghanistan. I just know what I've heard on the news. Then you'll only really know about events in Helmand province. Kost is on the Pakistan border. It's unusual among Afghan provinces because many of its men go abroad in search of work, typically to Pakistan, sometimes further afield, leaving the women at home to raise their families and tend the farms. Nadia was the oldest of a family of girls. Her father worked away until he died, and, as is the tradition in that area, she was brought up as a boy. As she awkwardly followed Christakos from the car, Dana saw that both Anderson and Mark were looking puzzled. She straightened up and turned to Misen. Talk to me. I can't see anything inside, ma'am. Windows all boarded up, and we haven't heard anything, but I wouldn't like to say one way or another. How long before the trolls get here? asked Mark. A few more minutes, Stenning told him. Those big wooden doors are old. We should be able to go straight in. Tell everyone to wait, said Dana, but keep listening and let me know the second you hear anything. She turned back to Christakos. What do you mean, brought up as a boy? Nadia didn't say anything about that to us. We have her on tape talking to Lacey, saying that she married young into a good family, but her husband divorced her because she had three daughters and because there were some spurious doubts about her virginity. It was a very convincing story. Nadia had never had a child, said Christakos. I'm quite certain about that. She was still a virgin when she came to us. I'd go so far as to say she would never have been allowed to have a child. Her village treated her as a man, you see. She was expected to work in the fields like a man, provide for her family, make decisions, help govern the village. She even dressed as a man. She told us nothing about that. The sound of a diesel engine reached them. A police van was approaching. Anderson went over to talk to the sergeant in charge as several uniformed officers jumped out. Her story came out over the course of several weeks, said Christakos. She became quite friendly with Catherine Markova. Frankly, it didn't surprise me. Given how prized sons are in Afghan families, how relatively unimportant girls are, it's quite common in some areas for girls to be brought up as boys from a very young age. Some of them don't even know they're girls until puberty hits and the bodily changes become evident. Quite what psychological damage has been imparted by that stage, I really couldn't say. Chapter 95. Lacey and Dana. Nadia? No, she wasn't seeing things. That was Nadia, crouched on the ledge by the boat. 
Nadia, not dead after all, not a rapidly bloating corpse tied by the neck to a mooring ring, but very much alive. Those big, silver-grey eyes hardly seemed to blink in the half-light. A scuffling noise at her side told her that Pari was moving deeper into the tunnel. With Nadia blocking the way out was the only sensible thing to do. Where was Thessa? Were the two of them in this together? Lacey set off in Pari's wake, her back pressed against the damp bricks, forced to stoop by the low, curved ceiling, constantly afraid of missing her footing. She sidestepped as fast as she dared, occasionally glancing ahead, more often looking back, watching the woman who was coming after them. Nadia came steadily, but slowly, as though not wanting to risk falling back into the water or to get close to the oar Lacey was still holding. Or maybe she just knew they couldn't get out. Lacey risked another look forward. If Nadia and Thessa were working together, Thessa could be waiting further up the tunnel. Think about what you're doing, Nadia, she called. If you kill us, you'll never see your children again. Nadia paused and spat some angry words in her own language. She says she has no children, you idiot, translated Pari. She never did. She never had chance. Go, Pari, said Lacey. Find that ladder. There'll be one. There always are in these tunnels. Pari hesitated. But about Thessa? Bloody good question. Where was Thessa? What was Thessa? Had she been in the water just now? Had she pulled Nadia away from Lacey? Pari started moving again, and Lacey followed. Nadia matched their pace, stalking them through the tunnel. She was like a cat, waiting for a wounded bird to scrabble out from beneath the bushes. The tunnel curved, taking away the pale light of Thessa's lantern. They would have been in complete darkness were it not for the occasional ventilation grids in the roof. So far, it seemed exactly the same as the tunnel she'd searched with Fred and Finn. At last, Lacey felt something hard and cold jar against her right shoulder. Yes, a ladder up to street level. Pari, driven by panic, was already several rungs up. Unsure how to follow her, as soon as she took away the threat of the oar Nadia would be upon her, Lacey stayed where she was. Then a sudden flurry of movement behind Nadia caught the attention of them both. Thessa was moving quickly towards them through the water, swimming butterfly, a stroke particularly suited to her anatomy. Without thinking, Lacey raised the oar and shoved Nadia hard in the back. As she fell into the water, Thessa was on top of her instantly. The two swimmers disappeared in a fountain of black, foam-topped water. Lacey, I can't move it! Parry was at the top of the ladder, had reached the manhole that blocked their escape route. Lacey took another step up the ladder and stopped. She couldn't leave Thessa. She jumped back down onto the ledge, her feet splashing noisily in the water that had by now completely covered it. Directly in front of her, the head and shoulders broke the surface of the water. Nadia was back. Women like Nadia have no real place in the world, Christakos was saying as the uniformed team unloaded the tubular steel reinforcer that would break open the door of the pumping station. Their position is worse than that of servants, of slaves even. They are like the ghosts of slaves. I don't understand, said Dana. They are not men. They might be taught to fight, to handle guns and defend their families, but they'll never be accepted among the men. At family gatherings and weddings, they have to stay with the women, but they're not proper women either. They're not allowed to marry, have children, wear feminine clothes. Other women treat them as freaks. They're called nakazak. It means eunuch. Children throw stones at them in the street. They don't fit in anywhere, and if they come to the attention of the Taliban, they're likely to be executed. For once, Dana really didn't know what to say. There was an explosion of sound as the steel ram banged into the warehouse doors. The doors held. There was an incident shortly before Nadia left Afghanistan. It was the catalyst for her leaving in the first place. What happened? Dana asked. The team at the door were about to try again. The Taliban saw her out in the street, unveiled, and arrested her. They chained her in a storm drain and left her there. It was dry, but they knew, and she knew, that once the rain started, the empty drain would become a torrent and she'd drown. She was left there for two days, chained by the neck, 
waiting to drown. None of her friends or family helped her. In the end, it was men working for me who helped her escape and come here. The doors fell inwards, and the officers disappeared inside, Mark in the lead. Stenning, Anderson and Misen followed. Dana could see beams of light as torches were switched on and shone around. She and Christakos stepped forward until they were at the entrance of the building. She was looking down. That was her first surprise, although she'd been told the pumping station was half underground. The pale bricks and tiled interior reminded her of Victorian public baths. There were lots of hiding places, stone columns, arched recesses, huge iron plinths. The team were moving cautiously. Even Mark was keeping his head, but Stenning was still, his torch beam fixed on something on the ground. He looked up at Dana, and she saw his lips form a single word, blood. With a growing sense of dread, she unlocked the cuffs and released Christakos. Go first. She indicated the stairway down. Slowly, stay close to me. It's clear, ma'am. The uniformed sergeant came to meet them before they were halfway down. He looked up, his face all angular shadows in the dim light. No sign of anyone, but there's water on the floor, and one of your colleagues has found what could be, I know. Dunn had reached the bottom step. Mark was at the far side of the room, peering into the first of three large outlet pipes. She hadn't noticed before, but he'd brought one of the life jackets from Fred's Targa with him. Shit. Mom, there are weights here. Misen was at one of the arched recesses, looking up at a shelf. Just like the ones we found in the marina, and I'm pretty certain these are linen shrouds I'm looking at. This is where the bodies are wrapped and weighted. But not drowned. Mark was wearing the life jacket now. That's happening somewhere else. Lend us your torch, Pete. No! Dana strode over to the outlet pipe as the torch was passed from one man to the other. No one is going into the sewer. It's too bloody dangerous. He shook his head. I'm not one of your officers, Dana. He pointed back over her shoulder. You need to keep talking to him. Ask him if that sister of his really is a cripple, because if she is, there's no way she can get into this place. Have a look around. For a second, he fooled her. She took her eyes off him to look round at the doors high in the wall, at the steep iron staircase leading down, at the precarious ladders, at the three outlet pipes that were the only access to the sewer. In the seconds it took her to realise he was right, he'd gone. No! She held up her hand to stop Stenning, who'd been on the verge of following him. I'm not responsible for what D.I. Jewelsbury does. You, on the other hand, are staying here. Gail, get hold of Chief Inspector Cook. If the sewer has to be searched, his officers will have to do it. She walked back to Christakos. We finished searching the South Dock Marina, she told him. In addition to two more bodies, we found the weights that we believe were attached to Anya, Fahid and Rabia Khan. Nothing else. He stared back, not really taking in what she was saying. You mentioned nine women, she said. It is just possible that four of these women are still alive, that your sister really did help them escape. Alex, in your opinion, was Nadia Safi capable of violence? Christakos thought for several long seconds before speaking. I'm no psychologist, but what struck me about Nadia was that, although her lot in life had been dictated by men, it was women she hated. Other women, particularly young, attractive women, those who were desirable. They engendered feelings of absolute rage in Nadia. When we realised quite how disturbed she was, we decided to release her without further treatment. Then she vanished. We were worried, of course, but not entirely sorry to see the last of her. Christakos took a deep breath. Detective Inspector, I think I've been a complete fool. My sister isn't a killer. She just set one free. Chapter 96 Lacey Keep going, Lacey hissed to Pari as she scrambled up the ladder towards her. More loud breathing, little gasps of distress. Pari wasn't strong enough. Give me some room. Lacey started climbing again, moving upwards until she and Pari were side by side on the ladder. She reached up and the two women pushed at the grill together. Finn had had trouble with a couple of these covers. Mud, 
dirt and debris got caught and stuck. You just had to push hard and not give up. She felt it move. She could do it. She could get them out. And then a sound below turned her heart cold. Nadia was climbing after them. In a few more rungs, a couple more seconds, she'd be able to reach Lacey. All she'd have to do would be to grab hold of Lacey's foot and take her own weight off the ladder. They'd both plummet to the water, and Lacey really wasn't sure she could fight the woman off a second time. Lacey pushed again on the iron grill above her. She climbed up another rung, partly to get her legs further from Nadia's reach, partly to give herself more purchase to push against. The grill moved. The ladder was shaking with the weight of the woman climbing it, and Lacey could hear laboured breathing below her. Any second now, she'd be within reach. The cover came loose at the exact moment that Pari gave a furious shriek. Lacey glanced down to see her kicking at Nadia, trying desperately to keep her at bay. Lacey pushed again, and the grate slid free. Pari, now! Pari shot up the last couple of rungs and into the street above them. Lacey was about to follow when a strong, wet hand clamped around her ankle. She looked down to see the snarling face getting closer. Then Nadia herself was the one screeching in pain. Below her, Lacey could see Thessa, who'd raised herself from the water somehow, clinging to Nadia. The three of them were dangling like a human rope, and only the grip Lacey had on the ladder prevented them from tumbling down. Lacey! Pari's face was above her, her arms lowering the grill again. For a second, Lacey didn't get it. Then she took one hand off the ladder, felt the other almost wrenched apart by the weight it was holding up, grabbed the grill and helped Pari guide it through the hole. She let it fall. Thessa, get out of the way, she yelled. Nadia's grip broke. She gave the heavy grunt a body makes when all its air is expelled at once and fell backwards but she twisted as she fell, and the grill continued falling. It hit Thessa too, and took her down. When Lacey jumped back down onto the ledge of the sewer tunnel, neither Nadia nor Thessa were anywhere to be seen. Thursday, 3rd of July. Chapter 97. Lacey and Dana. Industrial units filled the skyline in front of them. There was a chain-link fence several metres high, almost at the water's edge, a fleet of white vans visible beyond it. They were heading for a spot on the south bank, a mile or so downstream of Greenwich. Sometime overnight, the weather had broken. Cloud upon cloud had banked up overhead, and the wind humming down the Thames felt like winter, or a normal English summer. On the narrow, rock-strewn shore, six people were waiting. The pathologist, Mike Cates, three members of the Marine Unit's tactical team, and two Socos. Something lay on the stones behind them. Lacey could barely make it out, and that was probably deliberate on their part. Behind her in the dinghy, Finn Turner was talking on the radio. Did you catch that, he said, when he ended the conversation. Without turning round, Lacey nodded. The body of a young woman, found in the Thames by Cleopatra's needle early that morning, was now at Wapping Police Station and had been identified as that of 28-year-old Nadia Safi. After her fall from the ladder, the tide had swept her upstream and she'd become trapped between two boats. What you probably didn't hear is that she had a connection with South Dock Marina, Turner said. Her employers kept a boat there. Nadia went down there to clean it. Stock it for weekend trips. The small motorboat they also kept there is missing. Almost there. Turner cut back on the throttle, relying upon momentum to carry them the last few yards. One of the tactical teams stepped into the water and caught the rope. The dinghy stopped and Lacey climbed out. The first pair of eyes she met belonged to the pathologist. Good to see you, River Police. There was something about his scowl that wasn't quite as rigid as normal. That made her think he might actually mean it. Thank you for waiting. She let her eyes travel past him to the small, pale form on the bank. Is that her? Tight-lipped, he nodded. We were identical twins, said Christakos, once he'd taken his seat in the interview room. 
which of course means we were the same sex. My brother was named Mujib, but because of his condition, he never felt comfortable being male. He didn't have a penis, you see. Christakos turned to Anderson. And it's impossible to consider yourself male without a penis, wouldn't you say, Sergeant? I can't say I've ever given it much thought, said Anderson. But I don't imagine it would be easy for a boy. When we were in our early teens, I first saw the signs of his veering towards the feminine, Christakos said. He grew his hair longer, started wearing looser clothes in brighter colours. Just before he left Afghanistan, he started calling himself Thessaloniki, Thessa for short. It was a joke on me, you see. Alexander the Great's sister was reputedly a mermaid of that name. Not that he thought I was great. It was more of a comment on my arrogance. Arrogance, thought Dana, looking at the broken man across the table, which had vanished completely. It was as though his sense of self had died along with his twin. What exactly was his condition? she asked. Siren Amelia, said Cates, a birth defect characterized by an apparent fusion of the legs into one single lower limb. It's also known as mermaid syndrome. Lacey kept her eyes on Cates. She wasn't ready yet to see what the river had left behind on the south shore. I've never heard of it, said Turner. From the blank faces around them, it seemed nobody else had either. It's very rare, admitted Cates, and it's usually lethal. Most babies with the condition are stillborn. Few of them live more than a couple of days. There's nothing in the literature to suggest someone could live to this age, or indeed be quite so strong. She was going to have to look sometime. It was why she'd begged to be allowed to come here. There was a demon to be faced, and it lay, cold and dead, just a few yards away. What causes it? asked one of the Sokos. No one really knows, said Cates. For a while it was thought to be linked to maternal diabetes, but that's more or less been ruled out. From what I could gather, and I didn't have a lot of time to read up, there's an abnormality in the umbilical cord that prevents proper development of the lower limbs and a number of abdominal organs. Typically, the kidneys don't develop, and so the baby dies of renal failure. Nobody expected Majib to live said Christakos. Babies with that condition almost never do, but it wasn't quite so severe as some of the cases you hear about. He had one kidney that performed perfectly well, and another that was weaker but still functional, and significantly, he had a perforate anus. He could process food and dispel waste products. He lived. It can't have been easy for him, said Dana. Christakos gave her a look that suggested she had no idea. Afghanistan in the 1950s, he said, and our parents didn't take the care of him they probably should have done. There were a number of incidents when we were small, other children from the neighborhood. It didn't always start and finish with name calling. A favorite game was to throw him into the lake and watch him swim. Of course he could, instinctively, but the games got rougher. One time I really thought they were going to drown him. Siren Amelia said Lacey. Sirens sang, didn't they? They sat on the rocks and sang to sailors. The women in the clinic could hear Thessa singing to them. Mythology is not really my thing, River Police, said Cates. I'll do my best to tell you how he died, but beyond the... I killed her, said Lacey. She was trying to save me, and I killed her. I dropped an iron grate on her head. She fell back into the water, and if she wasn't dead by then, she drowned. Silence. She could sense the nervous glances flying around above her head. Well, that should save me some time, said Cates. Over the years, I actually started to think of her as my sister, not my brother, said Christakos. Without any sex organs, she never experienced puberty. There was no body hair growth, no deepening of the voice. But strangely, she did grow quite tall and very strong. Her swimming ability was really quite remarkable. She swam, quite literally, like a fish. And when she wasn't swimming, she was always out in one of those silly little boats. She used to say it was only on the water that she felt really at home. She almost became the thing she most dreamed of being, a mermaid. Thessa lay curled on her side, almost as though she were asleep. 
Her long hair, still damp, streamed out behind her on the shore. Her face could only be seen in profile and was mushroom pale against the mud. Lacey stepped closer, and the group on the shore, who'd stepped away to let her through, watched. Above the waist, Thessa's torso wasn't so dissimilar to Ray's. Broad swimmer's shoulders, arms that were both thin and strong. The empty breasts were simply the result of pectoral muscles wasted by age. Below the waist, Thessa's body bore no resemblance to anything human. I'll know more when I can get her back. Kate's was standing very close behind Lacey. So was Turner come to that, as though they were afraid she might fall. But from what I can see, it's not just a question of two legs joined by skin. There's an actual fusion of the long bones. She had one long, strong lower limb. It doesn't really look anything like a tail, does it? said Lacey, feeling an unfamiliar dampness in her eyes. Thessa's lower limb was wide at the hip before tapering sharply. It was several inches shorter than one might have expected her legs to be, judging from the length of her torso. There was no knee joint that Lacey could see, but a mechanism for bending the limb must surely exist. How else would she have been able to swim so well? She had almost perfectly formed feet. They were simply joined at the ankle. Not in broad daylight, said Cates. It looks like what it is. One of the numerous imperfections the human race should have come to terms with over the years. But at night, at a distance, in the water, well, I can see how gullible romantic types might start fantasizing about mythical creatures. Tide's getting close, said one of the marine unit officers. We really should... He left the suggestion hanging. Are you done here, Lacey? asked Cates. She nodded and stepped away while they lifted Thessa and placed her gently in a body bag. Turner had returned to the dinghy, was coming towards her now, carrying a cone of cellophane. He pulled it away from the flowers within and handed them to Lacey. They're lilies, she said to no one in particular. She and Alex were born in May. She bent and put the five stems on the shore, where the outline of Thessa's body could still be seen in the mud. Should be Lily of the Valley, really, but you can't get it this time of year. She stood up, sniffed, and wiped her eyes. It was her birth flower, she explained. Mine's Larkspur. Friday, 18th of July. Chapter 98. The Mermaid. On the bow deck of her boat, Lacey lay in the sun. In the two weeks since Thessa and Nadia had died, her Bollywood tan had faded. She decided, though, that she rather liked herself with a golden glow. And who knew, maybe one of these days there'd be someone else around to admire it. Eileen's large bare feet came into view along the deck. Post for you, Tracy. Lacey sat up and refastened the strap on her sea-green bikini. You know perfectly well what my name is. She took the assorted bundle of envelopes. You're just winding me up. Eileen walked away, back towards the cockpit. Don't know what you're talking about, she muttered. Then she stopped and turned back. A couple of those were from estate agents. You selling up? Reluctantly, Lacey nodded. Dry land. That was what she needed right now. It was a pity. She loved her boat. She loved the people she'd come to live amongst. But she'd never be able to look out at dark water, at dreary shores again, without thinking of what she'd lost, of the friend she'd destroyed. Her fingers tore open the first speculative letter. One from Belmarsh as well, said Eileen, just before she disappeared. Belmarsh? Discarding the estate agent's letters, Lacey found the envelope at the bottom. The address was handwritten, the postmark Belmarsh Prison. My dear Lacey, we are all defined by the physical shell that carries us around. In this place, where so much time for reflection is allowed me, I find myself dwelling increasingly upon what my twin might have become, had it not been for the minor defect in antenatal programming 
that stunted and twisted the normal formation of limbs, and thus of a life. She had a rather brilliant, if wayward mind, but I guess I don't need to tell you that. I'm only too aware that, technically, what I did was a crime. I make no excuses for myself, except to say that insofar as the clinic is concerned, we did no harm, and that the women we brought into the country left us to lead happier lives. I will be accused of exploiting the vulnerable for the sake of greed, and it is a charge I must accept. My conscience was salved a little by the number of women I helped escape from a regime far harsher than anything this country has to offer. I'm so glad you are safe. If any part of conscious thinking remains to her, then Thessa most certainly will be too. You may think her mermaid obsession foolish, but it was born out of a need to feel complete, not a product of a defective accident of birth and the prejudice of bigoted minds, but a creature of purpose, whole and splendid. She and Nadia had more in common than either would have imagined. She was always drawn to female physical perfection, and you rather dazzled her. She told me once that she could see into your heart, and that it was cold, but true as silver and strong as steel. She hoped that one day you would be able to return to your own name, to throw off the heavy veil that is lacy flint, and find the purity within. I hope so, too. Yours truly, Alexander Christakos. Seconds went by, and then minutes, and the sound of a mobile phone ringing found its way into Lacey's head. The estate agent's letters lay on her lap still, but without knowing, she'd torn them into a dozen pieces. She lifted her hands and let the breeze take them, up and out, over the water. The caller was Dana. I've just heard from the UK border agency, she said. They've decided to grant visas to all three women, and in time, process their applications for residency. Looks like they're all going to be able to stay. It was good news. Jamila, Shireen, and Umu, the three women who, in addition to Nadia, had been helped by Thessa to flee the East Street Clinic, had been found alive and well. Jamila worked as a seamstress. Shireen was already married, and Umu had started her own baking business. None had shown any desire to go back to Afghanistan. None had had anything negative to say about Alex and his clinic staff. As an experience, it had been boring, a little bewildering, even uncomfortable at times, but more than worth it in the end. Even when told about the possibility that their eggs had been illegally taken, they'd been sanguine. Different world, different priorities. Pari was in hospital, recovering quickly from ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, and already causing consternation among the hospital staff by regularly joining and surpassing the teams of ward cleaners. In the coming weeks, Dana's team would begin the process of tracking down all the women who'd passed through Christakos's unofficial clinic. Lacey wouldn't be surprised if they weren't all in similar positions to the three that Thessa had liberated. Lacey, there's something else, very hush-hush, that I thought you should know. It's been a confidential bulletin round, SO10 have just completed a long-running undercover operation. Over a dozen people have been arrested in South London. It's been their biggest success in years. Lacey took a deep breath. It's over, Lacey. I wouldn't be surprised if you have a visitor any time soon. When Dana had hung up, Lacey stood and climbed onto the next boat. The tide was almost at its peak, and from Ray and Eileen's boat, so much bigger than her own, she could just about see the tip of the old dredger. Eileen, she strode quickly back to the cockpit. Can I borrow your binoculars? Back on deck, she focused on top of the old crane. Something new. A piece of fabric blowing in the breeze that never even on the hottest day left the creek in peace. A flag. A white skull standing out in relief on a black background. Two crossed swords beneath it. The Jolly Roger. The pirate's flag. Her canoe was long gone. Ray's motorboat was still in the hands of the crime scene investigators. It would take far too long to drive round. Eileen, she said, I'm going for a swim. Good God, but the creek felt cold without a wetsuit. 
several quick strokes of front crawl to stave off the shivering, and then, on impulse, she switched to the undulating movement of a stroke she hardly ever used, wasn't even that good at. It just seemed right, somehow. Butterfly. As she rose from the water, her arms high and straight, she could see Eileen's shadow. She was standing on the port deck, watching her swim away, and Lacey knew, without turning round, that the older woman was smiling. She swam on, towards the tall, male figure that had appeared on the deck of the dredger, knowing that whatever happened, this strange, forgotten, watery wasteland was her home now. She was staying, and she would swim. The creek was going to keep its mermaid. That is the end of A Dark and Twisted Tide. It was written by Sharon Bolton and read by Lisa Coleman. Audible hopes you've enjoyed this programme.